The book is called The Smooth Hops and Bad Bounces from the Inside World of the Acclaimed Los Angeles Dodgers General Manager, the 10th General Manager in the history of the Los Angeles Dodgers. He is currently the Senior Advisor to the President of the Los Angeles Dodgers. What a great title for Ned Coletti, who's here on the Rich Eisen Show. Good to see you, Ned. Thank you, Rich. Good to be here. So uh, let's get into it right here and and now. You were the Dodgers manager, uh, general manager from 05 to 2014. So, so much of what we're seeing now, seeds planted during those periods of time. What did you, first time you laid eyes on Cody Bellinger would be when? What oh, about? probably his senior year. I went to high school in Phoenix and was always slick around the bag. He could play first base in the big leagues probably right then and there. A little bit of experience, really great athlete, but uh, had a great mind for the game. And as a young kid, to be able to slow a game down and to play it almost in snapshots instead of a movie type thing. We watch a game, we watch it like in a movie, right? Mm-hmm. Guys like that, Bellinger, Seeger, the greats of the game, especially the young guys that can do it, they break it down almost in snapshots. And they can slow the game down, kind of analyze it pitch by pitch. Mm-hmm. He had that ability right away. Dad played in the big league, so he had a little bit of the deal. Yeah, I remember Clay from uh, his uh, cup of coffee a yep. couple of years with the New York Yankees. Again, Ned Coletti, the general manager for many seasons for the L.A. Dodgers here in the Honda Insider Report on the Rich Eisen Show. How can you look at a high school kid and say that kid can play in the major leagues? Well, could, well he, was, he was actually easy to see and, and project because of the athleticism and how his mind worked. You could just see that the kid understood it better than anybody else on the field, better than anybody else – I saw him play against. He but, was like you, a man against boys, even though the birth certificate was the same. Yeah, and but you could say that, okay, this kid who's currently maybe taking AP geometry can <laughs> actually play in the major leagues in yeah. Chavez Ravine. You well, you, 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 I knew he was going to be a big league player. Did I think he was going to set the National League home run record right. for a rookie? I can't tell you I knew that was coming. Mm-hmm. But that the ability to play and the ability to be athletic and also play another position because he had, can play the outfield too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that it was, it was there. It was just a matter of time and, and acclimating him to different situations. We also put him up a year ahead of time every year. He ended up playing with older kids, older young players, professional players every season to kind of test him and to kind of keep the competition at a peak higher than him so he could reach it. He didn't, he didn't play with guys of equal ability. He played with guys for a while of more ability, mm-hmm. more maturity that he had to kind of grow into, and he did. And Seeger was another one of those guys? Almost identical. Seager's got another, the way his mind works is unique for his age. Um, you'll have a conversation with him as an 18, 19, 20-year-old. You thought you'd be talking to somebody 30 years old because he just has a presence to him. They're very similar in that they're both left-handed. They're both obviously great young players, but they both slow the game down. And in my career, I've seen great, great ones slow the game down. A Maddox, a Bonds, a Manny Ramirez, guys like that, Granky. But these kids at that age – unique to have that ability obviously you need more than just generational talents at certain positions in order to win in a major league baseball level uh and sustain it and then championship quality um thus you need guys like justin turner you need those guys what did you see in him that other teams did not we had a um we had three veteran utility guys the year before we had nick punto jerry harrison jr and skip schumacher and Jerry was going to retire. Nick and, and Skip were looking for two-year deals. I, I love these guys, but not enough to give them a two-year deal. And so they went elsewhere. And I was looking for somebody who was younger, who had some offensive ability to him. And JT always was a decent offensive player. Uh, offensive player. Defensively, he was a, a little bit average, I would say, at that point in time. And we waited for the market to clear a little bit. And then we went out and we signed him. And um, to his credit, he, he came here. He had a major league deal offer from us, and then we did a physical, and his knee, which he had operated on a couple of years ago, flunked the physical. So I went back to him and I said, I, I still want you, but I want you on a minor league deal, not a major league deal. And that's a tough thing for a big league player to accept. I says, are you healthy? He says, I feel great. I said, okay, the x-ray says otherwise. If you believe in yourself, come here. Look at my roster. You're the guy. You're going to be an extra guy here. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he took the deal, makes the team, Ends up now it's at a crossroads of his career too because the Mets had let him go and he started with Baltimore. He starts to work in the winter time like crazy, and he became not only one of the best hitters in the game but one of the best defenders in the game that he can hit and has hit as well as he has. A little bit of a surprise that his defense has come as long as it, as far as it has. That's a tremendous surprise. But this kid works. Baseball players are sometimes made in season. Most of them are made in the off season when everybody else is kind of taking it easy. This kid worked. Works every offseason now, works relentlessly to become the player he's been. Would you say something like Justin Turner, to use the phrase of one of your predecessors, that that's the residue of design? 
being lucky with him right oh, there? Yeah. To, to some extent, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah. Because I mean, where the hell did he come from? Yeah. Right. I mean, I mean, you just described oh, yeah. obviously the hard work that goes into it, and I don't mean to denigrate that at all. But no, I mean, don't you think the the Mets fans see them, and of course, everybody loves to dump on Mets fans in that yeah. regard that they could have had him, but they didn't really have the guy that the Dodgers have. The right toughest now. thing to have in 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 this business yeah. is patience, especially in baseball, because you play it every day, and so you're evaluating it every day. Mm -hmm. And it's tough in a major market, New York, L.A., a lot of them, to have the patience you're going to need in order to wait for somebody to mature and to wait for somebody to kind of figure it out. It took that much time for JT to figure it out. Until this year, we could say the same thing about Yasiel Puig. I was just about to say that. It's taken him a while, and you have to have the patience. And it's tough because you look at it every day. And if you every day, if you go, boy, I'm really frustrated with this, the play or this or that, and you let that build in, time, in, in five days, you know, five days in the in Major League Baseball is like five weeks in the NFL. You got five weeks of evaluation crammed into five days. So you have to be patient with it. And, and fans don't have to be patient with anything. But if you're sitting in that chair, you better be patient with it. The Honda Insider Report with uh, Ned Coletti, former general manager, now the senior advisor to the president of the Los Angeles Dodgers. When Puig was sent down to Oklahoma City last year, I thought that was it, honestly. I thought that this was a designated for uh, assignment, and then boom, yep. over. But what was going on? In, in Did you come close? Did the team come close to sending um, Puig packing last year? I don't think so. You know, my, my role is not what it was, so I can't no, I tell understand. you exactly what that is. But I, I can tell you that it was, it was time. It was time for him really to be held accountable. And I, I applaud Andrew Friedman for doing it, and Dave Roberts. For your doing successor it. and yeah. your, the manager. Yeah, to, right. to really hold him accountable because he needed that change. And you see what he is today, and it's a different player. Still, still tremendous talent, but the focus and, and the pressure on him is different. It's less. He was a 3 4 5 hitter in that lineup, and pitching would eat him up. Guys who could really spin a breaking ball ate him up. Then suddenly he goes off to the side, he goes to the minor leagues, his name is all over trade rumors. All this is going on now. Suddenly, he comes into camp, and he's not the three, four, five hitter. He's got to make the team. Then he's going to play right field. Now you have a right fielder who has 30, 25 to 30 home runs, drives in 70-plus, plays gold glove right field, and he hits eighth. You know how many teams would take that? Everybody. <laughs> Everybody would take that. But that's what he's been able to do, and I give Dave Roberts a lot of credit for it. And the staff, the coaching staff, because people worked with him. And they stayed the course, but they made him accountable, too. So, uh, Ned Collette, again, the book is uh, Smooth Hops and Bad Bounces from the Inside World of the Acclaimed Los Angeles Dodgers General Manager. Uh, we had Bob Costas on in the first hour. I said, what makes the Dodgers so good? And he mentioned some of the guys that we've already spoke, but he's like, you got Kershaw at the top, you got Jansen in the back. Why did you look at Jansen and say, let's try and make him into a reliever here? How did that process go back? One simple thing. He couldn't hit. <laughs> And if he's watching, he's going to be he's going to be agitated with me because I actually said it publicly. He had a great arm and he had a good mind for the position because that that's a tough that's a manager on the field that position. Sure. And he and he knew it. And well, that's he, why so many he catchers have become managers. Absolutely. Right. And and he you know so he had a he had a feel for it. And we were coming up to a crucial time on his on his clock, so to speak, in that he had to be put on the roster. And I thought if anybody else is watching this guy's arm, they may be thinking the same thing we're thinking. And I would always tell my player development people every spring, we'd have meetings, I'd say, okay, remember, be on the lookout for a young player that we've got here that's kind of maybe hit the wall and is, isn't going any further in that position. But he may have a carrying tour, tool, tool or two mm -hmm. that can really be a big league thing. This guy's arm was that. How his, how his mind thought was that. And they came to me in like late April, Dijon Watson, and he says, you know, you, you talk about this all the time. What about Kenley as a, as a reliever? I says, let's go. So he talked to Kenley first, and Kenley says, I want no part of it. And I went to Kenley, and Kenley says, I'm a catcher. I'm going to catch in the big leagues. I says, I don't see it. And I says, I got to put you on the mound. I'm going to give you – it's my job to give you as good a chance to get to the big leagues as possible, and that's what I see. And he kind of begrudgingly did it. And we put him on the roster with only 12 innings of, like, A ball pitching under his belt. But we believed in what he was going to do and in the process of doing it. And we had great staff that was going to really kind of fine-tune it. Because it's not just throwing a ball over the plate. It's holding runners on. It's fielding your position. It's understanding that the throw a strike is great, 
but you have to throw an effective strike. Mm -hmm. And then as time went on, he started to develop the cutter, and the slider was always something he wouldn't do. I had many conversations with him his first year as a reliever where where we, we debated. I guess debate would be a, a, a kind word to say. We debated what to do and how to do it, you know? <laughs> debated. But, but he's turned out to be the, as good a closer as there is. You look at his numbers and in a shorter window than Mariano Rivera. But if you look at his numbers compared to Mariano Rivera's, and if he's able to sustain that for a long period of time like sure. Rivera did, he's right there. Well, now that he's been paid, has he come up to say uh, thanks to you? Uh, yeah, he did. He, he did. did this past winter. Yeah, I get that okay. once in a while. Look at you. I get there once in a while. I get a text message. Thanks. You know, thanks for being tough on me. You oh, know? That's great. Yeah. Ned Coletti here in the Honda Insider Report. Again, it's brought to you by the Honda Odyssey. The available magic slide seats in the Honda Vac. It's never been easier to help keep the peace or clean up when your kids get a little bit too out of hand. So be sure to visit your local Honda dealer today. When we come back in 60 seconds, I want to ask you, heart of hearts, who the Dodgers are rooting for today in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, the first time you laid on uh, Clayton Kershaw. And what the hell the spin rate can tell me <laughs> as a fan here, okay? I want more of that. Ned Coletti, uh, right here on the Rich Eisen Show, back in 60 seconds. He's now a TV analyst here for the Dodgers on Sportsnet Los Angeles. His new book, The Big Chair, uh, is available in bookstores and online near you. The former general manager of the L.A. Dodgers, Ned Coletti, here on the show. Heart of hearts, deep down, Dave Roberts sitting there by himself. Andrew Friedman, your successor, sitting there by himself. Who are they rooting for today, do you think? They're rooting for weather. They're rooting for a long game. Mm -hmm. They're rooting to have as many pitchers on either side that, in the game. No doubt. That's what they root for. But, I don't think they root for one team or come another. On, come on. They don't, don't think they match. So then no, I ask no. you then, who, who, who do the Dodgers match up better against? It, it's tough to, to say they, they would have an easy time against a defending world champion. You got Strasburg and Scherzer. Two power arms in the postseason, that usually plays very well. But the way this series has gone, there's been so much wear and tear after the season on that staff. Yes. And today we'll add to that. I think uh, it doesn't matter who the Dodgers are going to play. I think the Dodgers go into this with a huge advantage. Okay. Rega against either one it of them. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And you can't, you can't pick who you want to play anyway. I did that 35 years ago. And the team you would I, do that? Oh, I would think. I said, well, I'd rather play this team than that team. And next thing I know, we got beat. So I said, I'm not picking teams anymore. You're out of that You're out I'm of worried that business. about my, my own, and that's it. Right. Uh, <laughs> now let's talk of the American League uh, yeah, Championship wow. Series. If I could give you, Ned Coletti, one guy to start a team with, Aaron Judge or Jose Altuve, they're both the same age. Wow. Who would you choose to start a team with? Altuve. I love Altuve. I mean, I, there's a lot to love with, with Judge, too. Don't get me wrong. I just love what Altuve does all over the game, all different things that he's got, uh, the ability to change a game so many different ways. Judge may have that in time. Judge's way to change a game now is a hit of 450 feet. Mm -hmm. But El Tuve, just the way he plays and the leadership he has and the maturity that he plays with, he is a, he's one of my favorite players to watch. Well, the, the, the distance that Judge has been having a problem with lately is 60 feet, 6 inches. Yeah. And well, so what do the Yankees do with a guy who just struck out a record number of times sitting there in the two-hole no matter, obviously, how valuable yep. he is. What do they do with him in that lineup, do you think, go, heading into the series with the Astros? They have to try and calm his mind down a little bit because it's only going to get tougher. Because when you're a hitter, you find out where your holes are in your swing this time of year because you're gonna get, that's going to get exploited time and time again. And I think it's, it's a matter of him. You can adjust a little bit at this time of year, but there's so much behind you already that it's tough to really change course athletically. But you have to think about it a little bit, not too much. You got to you got to measure how much you try to switch. But I think that that he's going to have to probably calm his mind down a little bit because the game goes fast and guys start picking it up and guys start moving faster than they, than it's probably healthy for their performance. I think calm him down. You got a great manager and Joe, somebody I've known since he was 21 years old, and and I think calming him down, getting him in a peaceful spot where he doesn't feel the need to change a game every time he swings the bat is mm -hmm. probably a positive for him. But this time of year, you find out what you can and can't do. Ned Coletti, former Dodgers general manager here in studio. What do you think Cashman's thinking today when he sees Gregorius, who he's traded, traded Shane Green for in a three-way trade, blossom in the way that he's doing, Todd Frazier, who he picks up with Dave yep. Robinson, with Canely, too. He didn't even yep. use uh, Girardi, went straight for six-out save with Chapman last night. 
but he picked up Robertson and Frazier in a, in a mid-season trade with Frazier with a huge at-bat prior to the huge at-bat by yes. Gardner last night and Robertson bridging from CC to Chapman. What, a, what does a general manager feel the day after something oh, like that? You're glad you made the phone calls. You're glad you did what you did. I've known Cash a long time. Cash has got a pocket full of World Series rings. I don't know that he's ever done as good a job as he's done this year. Really? This team, I think, is a year ahead of schedule. I don't think anybody expected them to be there. Think about being with the Yankees. Think about playing in Yankee Stadium in that market and kind of playing with the house's money at this point in time. Who expected this? They have zero pressure on them. Of all the teams that are going to be left after tonight, all have far more pressure on them than the Yankees. And the Yankees can put more pressure on anybody and their stadium and their fan base than any team. They are in a very unique position. I think Cash has done a great job. And when you add pieces like that, you add a Frazier, really, maybe maybe hoping you're going to get three or four iconic at-bats. At-bats that can change a game, change a series. Because this time of year, one pitch can write history for somebody. And I think that that's what you're looking for. And you're looking for that one time where – you, you know, you see his name called, you see him come out of the dugout to do this or do that, or he's in the lineup, whoever it may be. That's what you do it for. Yeah, and they and they had they didn't even use the players that they traded Andrew Miller and Chapman for last year. They still have those kids oh, yeah. going through the pipeline. Oh yeah. For the future. For in him to do what to he what's did. going on right now. Yeah, for him to do what he did and in that market, as you know, that's that's not an easy place to say we're gonna right. rebuild it. Yeah. You gonna what? You know, but that that's what they've done, and they've done it on the fly, and here they are. A couple more minutes with former Dodger GM Ned Coletti. I give you Trout Harper. Who do you start a franchise with, one of the two? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. Nah, that's why I only asked those. Trout Harper. Who would you – you only get one. Give me another one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't go that way. That, that is that is different. They're kind of dead even, right? Oh there, yeah, you? I mean they're both they're both young players. You know, Trout is magnificent. He's Center magnificent. Field, you know, he's he's a he's he's DiMaggio. I mean, he's one of those guys that's like that. And Harper, I don't even know how good Harper's going to be yet. Harper may be there's Trout is as good as Trout's going to be. That's I'll say it that way. He he is what he is, which is terrific. Harper, I still think that we don't really know how good he could be. Mm -hmm. I think there's still another level for him, okay. which is saying something. All right. What the hell does spin rate tell me? Why do spin I hear rate. all this stuff? Seriously, I don't know. do you believe in this stuff? I think it's something. I, I still go the old school of, of I watch, I, I need to know who the person is, I need to know who the soul of the player is, who's inside the uniform. I look at spin rate, exit velocity, things like that. It can tell you a little bit of a story, but. It doesn't. It doesn't tell me enough. You know, I did invent uh, reentry velocity. Did you know that? <laughs> when, when you have an outfielder, when you were an astrophysicist, well, no, no, or like, what? like this past year, I was doing doing TV, at, you know, down yeah. the street with the with the Dodgers network, and I said we ought to keep track of how fast they're throwing the ball in the outfield. How much velocity does the outfielder throw to a base on? Yasiel Puig certainly was a guy that would get that. So I've invented that. It's not quite copyrighted yet, but it will be. But I think well, you, it, it adds to the, the to the show. It adds to the game to talk about spin rate and exit velocity, this and that. I just cared if the ball went over the fence or not. Are you a dinosaur in that regard? Maybe. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, I'm just trying to determine if analytics – has really benefited the game or I think, not? I think it has. I think it, I think it has its place, and I think it does have great value. My career really started to take off because I used to do analytics by hand. This goes back 35 years ago. One of my first managers and one of my first GMs was Jimmy Fry, mm -hmm. who was a coach for Earl Weaver. And Earl Weaver used to use matchups. He used to use how do guys perform close and late, runners in scoring position, home road, day, night. But you didn't have any service that would keep this for you. So you had to do it by hand. So when Jimmy Fry comes to manage the Cubs in 1984, he asked me if I could do this with all the Cub guys. And so we did it. And we did it by hand. So I see the value of it. There's no doubt. I'm probably 52-48. 52, 48. 52 I want to see who it is. I want to learn who the people are. 48 is, okay, show me the trends. Show me the rates. Show me, predict the future based on a numerical analysis. I can buy into that. But I still want to know. Who's inside the uniform? And in terms of Earl Weaver, I mean, the fact that you could sit here and say, with the, the way the game is today, right, that somebody's strategy of playing for the three-run home run would be cutting edge. <laughs> right? I mean, look at today's game. Everybody's, yes. playing, everybody's playing for the nine-run oh, home yes. run. Oh, yeah. Right now. 
Oh, yeah. It's strikeout or home run. And that was the <laughs> – back then, it's just – That was Weaver. That was the strategy. Oh, don't yeah. Run, don't bunch somebody over. Oh, yeah. Don't play small ball. Played for the beginning. And then people yeah. you know, people didn't agree with that. And now, now – he, he'd, he'd be in his prime right now. My God. <laughs> What would he think of He'd be writing velo- books. He'd be doing movies. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be talking about exit velocity. Maybe not. My favorite my favorite yeah. YouTube video is him getting the gate. And uh, I forget what, what year it was where he gets thrown out by, uh, by an ump. And it, they're both mic'd up. <laughs> and my favorite part of the video is that we're showing it right now uh, on the screen. You could see in the old Memorial Stadium yes. scoreboard, it's the top of the first. <laughs> it's the top of the first, and it's basically nine minutes into the game yeah. after the first <laughs> And then oh, he boy. says he's going to go to the Hall of Fame one day, and the ump says back to him, what are you going to the Hall of Fame for, <laughs> effing up World Series? So are you going to the Hall of Fame, Earl? <laughs> I miss guys like that. You know, <laughs> Is uh, it, are there any guys like that anymore? Not um, anymore. I don't think so. Not Maybe anymore. one here or there, but the game used to be loaded with them. You know, some of the guys I had a chance to, to learn from, like Dallas Green, was six foot six and tough as nails, beautiful heart. Don Zimmer, I was with Zim for many, many years. Oh, Zim, what a beauty. Well, you too, man, Ned. Uh, This is the first time you've been here. I hope it's the first time of many. I really enjoyed this chat. Oh, stop. You too. Right back at you. Go check out the big chair. Get it. Read it. Great read. The smooth hops and bad bounces from the inside world of the acclaimed Los Angeles Dodgers general manager, Ned Coletti. The Rich Eisen Show. Weekdays at noon Eastern on radio stations across the country and audience. If you like that video, be sure to download our app. Don't have any memory on your phone? Let's start to delete some of those slow-mo videos you have. And you know which ones I'm talking about.